Hi, I'm Gavin. And I'm Ryan. And welcome back to The Sound Project. Today we're going to talk about ways that we have to stay on top of maintenance for isolation. Sometimes, like when you're talking about door seals and things like that, um, they can just get worn over time mm -hmm. um, to the point that they just need replaced. And that's not the door seal specifically is not a huge replacement, but some of them can be. Sure. Um, so let's go ahead and just talk about some of those topics. Yeah. So, you know, it's one thing you get done with the studio after building it for a year or whatever it yeah. takes. Um, and then suddenly you're just like, yeah, I just want to enjoy this thing. But just like a, any home, there is maintenance that has to be uh, involved. And that, that goes for your gear, but it also yeah. goes for your studio itself. And um, I mean, the first example that you mentioned was the doors. And over time, there's a lot of wear and tear. Like mm -hmm. if you're using your studio a lot and you're opening doors and closing doors and you have, let's say, rubber gaskets around the perimeter, um, they can break down over time. Um, sometimes there's foam gaskets and they can get brittle and flake mm -hmm. off. You know, there's there's just things that you want to want to look at. And, you know, when we have clients contact us, sometimes it's happened where um man, my, my studio is really well isolated, but suddenly like it's just not as good as it used to be. I mean, the first thing I think about is is door seals mm -hmm. and, um, you know, if there's any sort of, uh, uh, you know, cracking of the drywall, let's say. Sure. Uh, or uh, in, in some cases, if you use silicone caulking uh, at the seams of your room, but you didn't choose something that was like non-hardening, mm -hmm. uh, then over time that can become brittle and then crack. Like you see sometimes around a sink or something yeah. like that, the caulking that is used, it cracks and it it exposes a, a, a gap and that can weaken isolation as well mm -hmm. and so it's like that whole waterproof analogy we use all the time like yeah. if the the seal is is cracked in any way it's going to weaken the system and so um, just kind of keeping an eye out on things that can happen over time like that um, you know even even down to things like seismic activity in, yeah. in, in spaces, you know, it, it, how, how buildings settle and shift over time. And if that creates some sort of weak point or a crack or, um, you know, there's just so many things that can happen over the life of a studio yeah. um, that things just need to be kept up on. Yeah. There was a, a technique that you recently talked about that I thought was super interesting. And like after even being here for two years, it was the first time I think that I had heard it where... Mm -hmm. Um, to determine whether or not something is like a leak versus an actual isolation weak point was to like close your eyes and spin in a circle. And if you can point to where the sound is coming from, it's a leak versus a weak point. Yeah. And that was actually a tip that um, my good friend and colleague, Valerie Smith, told me um, like as I was talking to her about this uh, issue that we were having on a job. And, and yeah, she said, if you can close your eyes, spin around to disorient yourself. Yeah. And then if you can actually just point to where the sound is coming from with your eyes still closed, mm -hmm. then uh, it's definitely more of a leak rather than just the wall or the ceiling system not being massive enough or not having a high enough transmission loss value. Sure. Um, and I, yeah, I just thought that was a really neat uh, thing to share with people because mm -hmm. uh, you can do that very easily. Like right. every, everybody can, can uh, do that and see if it is a leak versus just the wall isn't built properly. So if it's something where like maybe the wall cracked somehow, um, um, how, what's like the fix for that? And I know it's going to depend on, you know, the project and all mm -hmm. of that, but in general, like, how do you approach that? Sure. Well, the thing is, is that if it's something that's visible, like mm -hmm. the, the caulking or something like that, that is, sure. is definitely split, um, then, then you can go over it again and just use a, a better sealant that's going to last for longer. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is that it's usually pretty invasive when this happens because, uh, a lot of times these uh, cracks and, and things will happen in the corners of the room, which, oh, by the way, is right behind a custom base trap that we built. Right. And so it's not as easy as sometimes you wouldn't even see it. And so it takes a lot of um, uh, kind of di diagnostic work to be able to figure out like what's actually happening. And so sure. a lot of times we would uh, bring in testing gear and we'd be able to take measurements in different spots of the room. Um, there was actually a, a job recently where the door seals uh, weren't working properly on, on this project. Mm -hmm. And we uh, ended up taking measurements at 12 different locations around the edges of the doors and was very quickly noticing that the bottom door sweep was not adjusted properly. And, uh, you know, that can get adjusted and it can improve the performance of the of the door. Sure. Um, so I think it, testing is is almost necessary for for uh, really diagnosing where the problem is. Okay. 
how like what testing would show like okay there's a crack on this wall like how do you how would you find the location based on the testing that you're doing yeah it's a little different than the normal isolation tests that we do because sure. uh, like normally we follow like ASTM E um, uh, 336, uh, ASTM <laughs> E336. And uh, that is something where it's going to measure the transmission loss of the wall system itself. But with this, it's more of just a, um, trying to go in and diagnose exactly where the issues are. And so it's using a, a quality um, uh, sound level meter that can uh, break things down by frequency bands. Sure. Um, so we can see like what the nature of the leak is. And, and a lot of times if it's a, a, a seal or a crack issue, you, it's going to be a lot of more high frequency based that's okay. going to cut through there. Um, there's one studio that we visited. Uh, we didn't design it, but uh, after it was built, they were having some isolation issues. So we mm-hmm. came in and uh, did some testing. But uh, honestly, I could just take my ears and put them in the corners of the room and you could hear that just sound was whipping around the, the corner of the drywall that way. And when I dug into it a little further, I said, hey, like, did, did they use silicone caulking on this job? And, and they're like, yeah, I'm not sure. I was like, you would know, cause there'd be tubes of it everywhere, yeah. you know, like, and they're like, yeah, we never saw one tube of caulking and it turned out the contractor didn't use any at all. And so sound could just go around that edge. And if a seal is faulty over time, uh, same thing's going to happen. And sure. it can really weaken, uh, weaken, like if you play pink noise in one room and then you go into the other room, if you can pinpoint these locations, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, a uh, something that, that deteriorated over time. Is that something that you also have to worry about with the interior treatment where like if you did a room within a room, Mm -hmm. do you have to worry about any of that treatment like settling or like the fact Mm -hmm. that it's all insulation if they do like stretch fabric? Yeah, that that can happen as well. Like, uh, you know, that would be on the sound quality side of things. It could make your room sound different depending on uh, if if that insulation settled. Like, for instance, if you had a, a corner base trap that's 10 feet tall and you stacked insulation and over time, gravity does its thing and mm-hmm. pushes it down and, and compresses it. It could leave, you know, the top foot or two feet of the corner untreated at all. And that's actually where you want base trapping the most is right. up in those upper corners. And so uh, a lot of times we'll work into our designs like if it's a 10 foot tall uh, trap, maybe mm-hmm. every two feet there'd be chicken wire or some wood bracing that would break up. So it's not just all of the insulation is supporting itself, there's there's tears to it. And, okay. and sometimes that can mitigate that that sort of issue. Nice. Yeah. So with that, how often would you have to like maybe check to see if you need to like, do I need to add extra insulation? Do I need to look mm-hmm. at some of my isolation? Um, yeah. Honestly, I think that that just happens when there's a problem. Okay. Like if, if, if uh, isolation becomes an issue and, and you're like, man, I'm hearing street noise, let's say, and I yeah. never heard that before, then it's time to dig into it and see what's happening. Sure. Um, and, or in your room, if like suddenly my mixes aren't translating the way it was and it has for the past 10 years, right. what is happening? And if you haven't changed any gear or speakers or things like that, then um, there's something physically going on probably in the room that, that has changed sure. in, in some way. Um you know, so I, I think that uh, I really wouldn't stress about it or put a timeline on it until right. there's an issue. That makes sense. Yeah. So those are all kind of things that you can control. Like if it's in my room, I can fix that. Yeah. Um, what if the, you're maybe in an apartment or like a rental type space mm-hmm. um, where maybe the space above you went from carpet, they tore it up and they ended up putting hard floor. Like yeah. we yeah. always talk about how it's really important to fix things like hard floor at the source. Right. But if you don't have any control over that, like how do you, how, what kind of recommendations do you have for that situation? Yeah, that's a really tough one. And I always try to stress to our clients that um, think about any scenario that would happen in the future. Obviously you don't wanna just have your brain spinning all the time on this, like what ifs, but it is something, if you're investing in a studio, uh, you're putting a lot of time and money into that. And if it's in a space that you don't own and you don't control the spaces around you, then you really have to look at like worst case scenario. Like suddenly I'm in a, like, you know, commercial area. I have the first floor. I have built this whole studio out and, oh wow, there's a, a tap dancing class that's going to be uh, directly above us and it's going to be hard floors and we're going to have to deal with that. And so sometimes that can be handled with language in, in your lease uh, with your sure. landlord about, you know, 
um, uh, who can be approved to have this or if there's decibel levels that you cannot exceed or if there's impact issues like it'd be good to, to think about that ahead of time because yeah. you can't always control your situation like things will change and sure. your example of like going from carpet with a heavy pad to a hard floor on concrete that will totally change how much footfall noise you're going to hear from above right. and there's nothing on your side of the equation that you're going to do to totally knock that out right. and it can really cause havoc. And this is something that we talk about fairly frequently with clients, but even if you do a room within a room, like mm -hmm. that still could potentially not cut all of it out. Oh, for sure. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, that, that is the case. Um, I also tell people all the time that, um, in those situations where there could be tenants to the left and right of you, yeah. I've had a lot of clients tell me like, Oh no, that they're cool. And they're only going to, uh, uh, be operation or operating nine to five and the studio doesn't open until seven o'clock, you know? Sure. And so we're good. And, and the thing is, is that that can happen. It's happened to some clients of ours to where suddenly that neighbor, either shifts their schedule or a whole different business comes in there and they hold the same schedule as you and now it's an isolation issue. Right. Um, and so just kind of future proofing for how things change. Um, if, if you think it's not going to change, it probably will. Right. You know, and so you always just try to plan for, for those scenarios. Yep, absolutely. And that's something too that I feel like um, has come up more frequently recently where it's like, if you're talking about isolation, um, you really like you're only as good as your weakest link. So yeah. like we've had a couple of people talk about like, well, I only have neighbors on these two walls. And it's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like you have to be able to treat, you have to build on all walls equally to yeah. be able to really get that isolation improvement. Yeah. Make sure there's no flanking paths. There's ways that sound can bypass what you've done. Cause you're only concerned about one thing. You should be concerned about all of it. Sure. Um, I also, uh, you know, there's situations that we've dealt with where, um, <clears throat> you know, we design a, a basement studio and I will ask the question, um, okay, I, I see on the plans, there's this room directly above the studio and they're like, oh, that's just the den. And I was like, it's it's kind of crazy to ask this question this this early on, but I'm like, would you ever anticipate that your in-laws would move, move in with you uh, yeah. in their later stages of life? And they're just like, man, I didn't think that'd be a studio question, but it is, it's like, yeah. it, it, like if they were to live in that space directly above the studio, that would be a disturbance to them. And, and mm -hmm. it's something to, to impact even also having the conversations with people who are single. Yeah. Um, and suddenly, <laughs> you know, uh, they're like, well, right above the studio is a master bedroom, but I'm not going to be in the master bedroom if I'm in the studio. So it's fine. Right. It, you, you look, <laughs> Only for now. <laughs> yeah, look 10 years down the road and like what's right. going to happen. Um, Especially and, when you're putting that kind of money into it. Like it's mm -hmm. just so much better to look at that on the upfront. For sure. Because once you've done it, you don't want to do it again or you right. might not be able to do it again. So yeah. it, it's always important to do it then. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, so those are two like really unique situations. But what are some other uh, situations that we could possibly run into there needing to be maintenance down the road? <clears throat> you know, I, I would say that you know, sometimes it depends on how you, let's say how you floated your floor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're using some of the tried and true methods of like uh, U-shaped pucks that go underneath floor joists or like a, uh, something like from kinetics, like an underlayment that you would put underneath the floor, um, you know, those things usually are going to hold up over time and mm -hmm. it's not an issue. Um, actually, kind of funny side story, those U-shaped pucks, mm -hmm. the reason they were designed that way was because a lot of the old studios in LA were designed on hockey pucks. Like that's how they floated their floor is just put a bunch of hockey pucks underneath <laughs> their joists. Problem is in California, you have earthquakes mm -hmm. and at, over time it would settle and shift and then uh, kick out those those hockey pucks and then there'd be weak parts of the floor and you get squeaking and, and uh, places where it's not structurally sound. So um, that's why those U-shaped pucks uh, can can prevent that because it has like some lateral movement control. Sure. And, and so, um, but if, if you're doing something, let's say on your own and let's say you're like, hey, I've I've got a friend who has this high density foam material and I want to put it underneath my flo to floor to float my floor. Uh, what if that breaks down over time or just keeps sinking? And right. like, yeah, it's things like that. You try to do things that you know has been tested sure. uh, by, by manufacturers and something that is, um, you know, maybe has a warranty or something mm -hmm. that, that is proven that, yes, this has been used in studios for 30, 40 years and with no issues. Sure. Um, and that, so the fact that you brought up the floated floor, that's actually another thing that's been coming up more and more recently in mm -hmm. like our discovery calls. Yeah. Um, so do you want to go ahead and explain like 
what the floated floor is and what the process is to build one. Oh, sure. Yeah. So a floated floor is something where uh, you're trying to isolate vibrations from getting uh, from the source down into the structure, because once it gets into the structure, it can travel anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually uh, recently at a, at a hospital and they were making uh, some renovations in the uh, floor below us mm -hmm. for the emergency room. Well, as soon as they drilled into the walls, it sounded as if they were in the room with us because as soon as they go into that concrete structure, it's just going to radiate throughout the entire building. Mm -hmm. uh, happened to me as well when I was uh, working on a project in Copenhagen. Uh, they, the crew started at four in the morning and mm -hmm. <laughs> it woke me up every day that I was there uh, because they were drilling into concrete. And yeah. as soon as it gets into the structure, it's just, it can travel anywhere it wants. Sure. And so with that, uh, if you can float your floor and cut it out at the source so that any vibrations like amps or drum sets or things like that, that vibration can't get into the structure as easily, you're going to be better off. Now, floated floors can be done in a lot of different ways. Like I mentioned those U-shaped pucks, you space them every 16 inches on center and you have this point isolation uh, control. You also have some like fiberglass materials and fiberglass pucks that is more of a springy in mm -hmm. nature, a little bit more resilient than than what the U-boats uh, like from, from Orlex or these U-shaped channels would, would offer. Sure. Um, and so, and there's even like spring isolation floors to where you can, uh, spring load an entire concrete slab and that's your floated floor. And that obviously gets a lot more detailed. Mm -hmm. You have to account for the mass that you're adding, like the concrete slab, the weight of it sure. and select the spring. So the mass spring system is, is, uh, correct with, if you do any of it wrong, sometimes that thing can get set in motion and there can be a resonance there and that wow. would also travel the energy through. So um, there's definitely some more like do it yourself type of things like mm -hmm. those U-shaped channels. Uh, but then there's other ones that like need to be engineered, you sure. know, and make sure that it works properly. So one of the main questions that we get, and I think these questions are generally like, if it's a house that someone's already, like the house is already built, it's already completely finished, but maybe they're adding a studio in the basement. Mm -hmm. Um, one question that we get a lot is like, okay, like I have a hard floor, like finished floor. Sure. So if they wanted to do a floated floor, they pull in that finished floor up and then like redoing it, like the jo the floor joists with those U-boats or mm -hmm. can they keep the finished uh, flooring and then put like a new floor over? Like yeah. what are the options in doing that? You could do either. Um, you know, a lot of times people don't want to take out the floor joist because it could be a structural issue with everything yeah. else. And so a lot of times it's done between uh, the plywood decking that maybe is on top of the floor joist and whatever your finish layer is. Like that's where the isolation takes place. Mm -hmm. um, that's usually the path of least resistance on something like that. Sure. Um, it can even be like weather patterns. Yeah. Um, you know, like as far as hail and storms and things like that and how that can impact what you've done on your roof, mm -hmm. you know, even, like we, we're always, um, when we're building from the ground up, we're giving specifications on how the roof membrane should be built so that impact noise from rain and things like that. Um, and you know, as weather patterns shift and change over time, like that could be something. Yeah. I don't think that one's as, uh, typical as sure. what you might get elsewhere, but it is something that, that could happen. Still hope you don't have a metal roof though. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That, that does cause issues. Um, going back to the floated floor piece, mm -hmm. um, one last point that I want to cover is that usually there's going to be a bit of a height adjustment. Mm -hmm. And so if they're going from one room to another, that is something that you kind of have to consider is that there could be either a step up or, yeah. you know, you have to modify that to you some do. degree. Yeah. I mean, especially if you want your, your uh, facility to be ADA compliant, um, yeah. you, you need to have proper ramps in place. If mm -hmm. you're um, going from a lower elevation to a higher elevation uh, to make sure it's wheelchair accessible. Right. And, and so that, that is something that we work with quite often uh, to make sure that we're, uh, you know, floating the appropriate rooms. Sometimes it, it costs causes us to float the lobby as well, even sure. though um, that's not a noise sensitive space, but it keeps everything at the right level. Right. For sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, this was, again, this is a little different for what we would generally talk about, but these things are important. And I feel like they're things that necessarily don't get thought about where it's like, oh man, like the weather, like, or seismic activity, like that can impact my isolation. And these are the ways that you can fix that. Yeah. I think it's, it's just always good to be on the lookout for if something changes when you think nothing changed, mm -hmm. then 
you know, you have to dive into that and just right. kind of diagnose where, where it's coming from. And, uh, you know, if you're keeping track of the fact that, hey, my, my signal chain's the same uh, or I didn't change speakers, I didn't change locations, there's there's nothing that should be uh, impacting this. Um, I didn't do anything to my construction. Uh, it, but if something is, is drastically different, mm -hmm. um, then it's worth looking into. For sure. Yeah. Um, and that's something, too, that it's, I mean, we can always, like, help out with that. So if anyone mm -hmm. ha does have an issue, you know, they can send us an email or what have you, and we can help them out with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, that's been another episode of The Sound Project. Thanks for being a part of it. Has there ever been anything in your studio that has changed over time and, and just was a head scratcher? Feel free to comment that below, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>